everybody hello hello and welcome to another uh, tea and talk in isolation session I hope you are all keeping well the nice weather seems to have gone away a little bit um, but at least it's good for the lawns my lawn particularly was looking all horrible and browned hopefully now we will get to see a, uh, a little bit of improvement and uh, all of our lovely flowers can grow ready for summer as well. But I do hope that you're all keeping safe and well in these very, very strange times. So today's tea and talk session wanted to talk to you a little bit about this, how things got their name. And there are some things that it's quite obvious how it got its name and other things that aren't quite so obvious really. So I'm going to start with um, a story that being a vegetarian isn't actually very nice, so I thought I'd do it first, but it is actually a very popular <clears throat> story about this little chap here. Now this chap here is actually my teddy bear. Look at the state of him, you're saying. I know, the poor little thing. And uh, the reason why he's in such a, a raggedy state is because my mum had to sew him back together again when he was uh, taken by our German Shepherd and given a little bit of a chew. And as you can see, his nose <laughs> and his mouth, when you got a little bit of a mouth there, and a little bit of an ear. Um, but this, this is my teddy bear, and I have had Pooh Bear um, from the day that I was born. So he's uh, he's only twenty one. Okay, he's a bit older than twenty one. I'll give you that. But uh, but no, Pooh Bear has been with me throughout my whole life, really. But how did the teddy bear? get its name. So, did you know that the teddy bear was invented in honour of President Theodore Roosevelt? And it all began when Theodore Roosevelt was on a bear hunting trip near Onward, Mississippi on the 14th of November 1902. Now, Mississippi's governor, Andrew H. Longino, had invited him. But unlike other hunters in the group, Theodore had not located a single bear. Now Roosevelt's assistants, led by Holt Collier, a born slave and former Confederate cavalryman, cornered and tied a black bear to a willow tree. They summoned Roosevelt and suggested that he shoot it. Now, viewing this as extremely unsportsmanlike, Roosevelt refused to shoot the bear. And now the news of this event spread quickly through newspaper articles across the country. And the articles recounted the story of the president who refused to shoot a bear. However, it was just not any ordinary president. It was Theodore Roosevelt, the big game hunter. So Clifford Berryman, a political cartoonist, read the article and he decided to lightheartedly satirise the uh, non-shooting of the bear. And this was the cartoon that he drew. As you can see, there's Theodore Roosevelt standing there proudly with his gun and he's got his hand out in kind of a stop motion to a, a gentleman who is clearly restraining a bear. And the, the little caption, the little writing underneath that says, drawing the line in Mississippi. So that went into the newspapers. 
that little cartoon. And Berryman's cartoon appeared in the Washington Post on the 16th of November 1902. And Morris Mitchum, a Brooklyn candy shop owner, saw the cartoon and he had an idea. He and his wife Rose also made stuffed animals. And Mitchum decided to create a stuffed toy bear and dedicate it to the president who refused to shoot a bear. And he called it Teddy's Bear. And here is a picture of the original bear. So that little chap there was actually the bear that was made and you can see that they're very proud of that and then you can see down there uh, just next to the bear there's a little plaque with uh, the picture of Teddy Roosevelt and this original teddy bear on it. And he had his wife Rose make the stuffed animals, make all of these teddy bears and they actually received Roosevelt permission to use his name. And Mitchum mass produced the toy bears, which was so popular that he soon founded the Ideal Toy Company. And to this date, the teddy bear has worldwide popularity and its origin can be traced back to Theodore's faithful hunting trip in 1902. Now the next word on our list, you might know as well. It is marathon, a marathon. So this story goes back a lot further than 1902. Once upon a time, during the war between the Greek city-states and the Persian Empire was the term coined. Now the Greek city-states were extremely divided because of the mountainous terrain. Therefore, they used water to transport information and goods. However, when the mighty Persian Empire wanted to take over the city-states, it tried so by sea. Now, the Persian Empire was land largely a land power, so not so much marine power. And there were two major cities of Athens and Sparta that were located on this map. So there you see Athens all the way up there where you see the little green shape with the triangle in it. So that shows you this route all the way through. Now, Athens was the smart one, and Sparta was the militaristically stronger one. And after a long and bloody battle, the city-states won. And although all their ships were destroyed, one man ran exactly 26.2 miles from the city of Marathon, and 26.2 miles is exactly a marathon. So from the city of Marathon to the city of Athens. Now it is believed that he died upon arrival, but he was able to say his last word, breathe his last word before he died, which was victory. A great last word indeed and very fitting for a marathon. Now the next word is actually a product name and there you can see it is the arm and hammer baking soda. Now arm and hammer producers of baking soda maintained their logo and their name after their original spice mill shut down in 1867. And why it seems strange that a company that produces baking soda has the emblem of an arm and a hammer, its origin is based in Roman mythology. 
specifically the god of Vulcan. He sounds terrifying, doesn't he? The god of Vulcan. So Vulcan specialised in fire and metalworking, and his embodiments were volcanoes and wildfires. His destructive power was so bad that temples for Vulcan were placed outside the city limits, so as to not cause any widespread city fires. The company given relation between Vulcan and baking soda was that it represented the brand's power to make dough rise. A little tamer, I guess, than Vulcan's original intentions. So now we move on to the human body and how certain body parts got their name. We all know this song, don't we? The hip bone's connected to the leg bone, the leg bone's connected to the knee bone. Well, it's not actually what those body parts are called, but I'll forgive you if you don't sing about the innominate bone connecting to the femur bone, the femur bone connecting to the patella bone. It just doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? And probably a little bit more confusing for children to try and learn. Well, when the ancient Greeks were naming body parts, they were probably trying to give them names that were easy to remember. There were texts, but the ancient world was very oral. And the people learning this stuff had to remember it. So the Greek scholars and later the Roman medieval scholars named bones and organs after and muscles after what they looked like. So the thick bone at the front of your lower leg, the tibia, is actually named after a similar looking flute. And as you can see, there's the picture of the tibia bone there. And also the picture of So then that is why it is called the tibia. Because there was a flute that looked like the tibia and that flute name was very similar to that bone. But sometimes the names get a little bit more abstract. So take the tragus or tragus. It's the tiny little flap of skin on the outer ear. So there it is, there's the tragus, that little bit right there. And it's actually named after goats. Now, not because it looks like a goat, but because some people have tufts of hair on their tragus, like goats do on their chin. Now, obviously, it might not be as extreme as this gentleman who has certainly taken many years to cultivate the hair on his tragus. But that is where it comes from, because of the goat reference. So, what about a name? What about Conway Twitchy, the late singer? Now, his real name was Harold Jenkins in the 1950s. And trying to make it big in the recording industry, he found that Harold Jenkins didn't exactly translate to thrills and excitement. So the story went that he and his manager took a map of the United States and put their fingers on it on Arkansas and Texas, to be precise. Conway, Arkansas, Twitty, Texas. And soon his records were enormous hits in the Rockola jukeboxes from coast to coast. So let's look at these words and these names. 
So when Kemmons Wilson first came up with the idea for standardised, affordable highway motels, he didn't have a name for it. His architect, Eddie Bluestein, as an in-joke, wrote across the bottom of his diagrams, Holiday Inn, after the Bing Crosby movie about a country lodge. Some joke. Wilson liked the sound of it, which turned out to be a spectacular business decision. And thus, Holiday Inn became the name of these affordable highway motels. Hagen Dars? Well, Hagen Dars is a made up combination of make believe words to make a brand of ice cream sound Scandinavian and inviting. But the words themselves, Hagen, and does, they mean absolutely nothing at all, except of course for huge profits for Hagen does. Popsicles, on the other hand, have a slightly different story. Now, popsicles started out as epsicles, and this was because they were named for their inventor, Frank Epperson. And here is Frank Epperson. So you can see there he is absolutely sharing one of his epsicles. So when he applied for a patent, the product was officially titled the Epsicle Ice Pop. But his children, though, and he is pictured there with one of his children. Children called this confection, dreamed up by their dad, their pop, a popsicle. So pops, sickle, and hence it became the popsicle, pops, sickle. So what about the names of countries? Some are named for people. Some are even named by mistake. St Lucia. This is one of the only examples of a country named after a woman, St Lucy. Columbus named several of the Caribbean islands he found after saints that he was fond of. St Kitts is named for St Christopher, his own namesake. Canada. Nata actually means village. It was mistakenly assumed to be the name of the country by 16th century explorer Jacques Cartier when he encountered the native people. And thus it became Canada. Taiwan. Taiwan has been known by many names, but its official name is Republic of China. But it's actually seldom called Republic of China in practice. In England, it was called Formosa until the early 20th century. And Formosa means beautiful island. And this was the name Formosa given to it by the Portuguese sailors in the 1500s. So even though it's really called Taiwan, uh, even though it's really called the Republic of China, it became known as Taiwan, beautiful island because of the Portuguese sailors. Now, there are some bands who have come up with their names in strange ways as well. Uh, take Leonard Skinner. Everyone probably knows Leonard Skinner, but here they are. So, the writers of Freebird went through a series of names before choosing Leonard Skinner. And Leonard Skinner came about in honour and actually a Mickey take of their old PE teacher, Leonard Skinner. And this Leonard Skinner was a legend amongst his pupils for getting all het up about long hair. 
Now, obviously, he wouldn't have got along with the band when they got older. But actually, relationships did improve, as Leonard Skinner did later MC one of Leonard Skinner's gigs. And this is a fun one, the word quiz. Now the story behind the origins of the word quiz, it is actually so good that we really wish it was true, but it probably isn't. Legend has it that a Dublin theatre owner made a bet that he could introduce a new word into the English language within a day or two. Uh, the amount of time differs in the different tellings of this story. And that the people of Dublin would make up the meaning of the word for themselves. So he wrote the nonsense word quiz, Q-U-I said, on some pieces of paper and got a gang of street urchins to write it up on the walls across Dublin. And the next day, everyone was talking about it, and it wasn't long before it became incorporated into everyday language, meaning a sort of test. Because this is what the people thought the mysterious word was supposed to be. Now, according to the telling of the story recorded in Gleanings and Reminiscences of F.T. Porter, written in 1875, the events of this humorous tale unfolded in 1791. And this is, I guess, where the story becomes a little less convincing. The word quiz is attested earlier than this date, and it's used to refer to someone who is eccentric or odd, hence the word quizzical. It was also the name of a yo-yo-like toy in 1790. That said, it's still difficult to find a compelling explanation for the origins of this word, so perhaps there is a, an element of truth in this fun story after all. And I'm going to end uh, this session with something that probably everyone has eaten. A sandwich. The nation's favourite lunchtime snack gets its name from the earth, uh, from the fourth Earl of Sandwich, John Montague. And here he is. Here is the lovely John Montague. So the story goes that 250 years ago, the 18th century aristocrat requested that his valet bring him beef served between two slices of bread. He was fond of eating this meal whilst playing card games, as it meant that his hands wouldn't get greasy from the meat and thus spoil the cards. Observing him, Montague's friends began asking the, for the same as sandwich. And so the sandwich was born. And though people did eat bread with food such as cheese and meat before this, these meals were known as bread and cheese or bread and meat. But because of the Earl of Sandwich and his obsession with putting his meat in between the two pieces of bread, the sandwich is now the ultimate convenience of food. Well, thank you very much for joining me today on this lovely session. And I mentioned in uh, my last email that we would try and have a Zoom session. So actually we all get to see each other and talk to each other. So this is going to be on Monday the 22nd of June at 2 p.m. So Monday the 22nd of June at 2 p.m. So the same time as Tea and Talk would normally run. And what we'll do is we will send out the link to Zoom. For those who haven't used Zoom before, there will be instructions on how to use it actually within the email as well. But we really hope that you can join us for that one so we can all see each other and have a proper chat and have a, a proper catch up with everyone. Well, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye.
from my little friend teddy bear here, my little poo bear. And we hope you keep safe and keep well until we see each other again soon. Many thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.